Hello, I'm Elizabeth Goldschmidt. I'm going to tell you today about the weirdness of quantum entanglement. So we're going to talk about the weirdness of quantum entanglement in the context of a measurement that we can make that demonstrates how quantum entangled states don't behave in the way that our intuitive classical picture of the world would expect them to behave. So this is related to the Nobel Prize that was awarded last year in 2022 for actually figuring out how to and making this measurement. Basically what happened was in the early 20th century as quantum mechanics was coming out, there were some, some parts of quantum mechanics that many people objected to, including Albert Einstein and others. And Einstein came up with an alternative theory of the universe that he thought would describe the same things that quantum physics could describe using something that he called hidden variable theory. So this is what we're going to talk about today. So the setup that we're going to use today is we're going to talk about measuring the polarization of photons, of particles of light. Um, polarization of light is something that you actually know a little bit about if you've ever worn polarized sunglasses and tried to look at a, a, at a screen as you tilted it or you tilted your head or at some reflection. Basically, the polarization of light is the direction that the electric field is going back and forth. That's the formal definition. But in practice, I have something called a polarizer, which has an orientation. And if I send light at it, if the light is polarized the same direction as the polarizer, the light will go through. If the light is polarized perpendicular to the polarizer, it'll bounce off. And if there's some angle between the two, it'll have some probability of going through and some probability of bouncing off that has to do with that angle. So the setup that we have is we're going to start with two photons. Photon A going to the left, photon B going to the right, and then we're going to be measuring their polarizations. I have some polariz polarizer here and some polarizer here. And if the photon makes it through the polarizer and I detect it, I'm going to assign that measurement outcome plus one. And if the, the photon bounces off the polarizer, and I detect it here, I'm going to assign that measurement outcome minus 1. Same thing over here. Great. Now, I'm going to say that I have two possible polarization settings for each polarizer. Obviously, I can rotate them however I want. But with two settings, this is what, the minimum that we need in order to demonstrate the weirdness of quantum entanglement. So for polarizer A, I have polarization Polarizer settings A1 and A2. For polarizer B, I similarly have polarizer settings B1 and B2. These are just the angles of the polarizer that I'm going to set. Now, the way that I actually measure the probability that the photons go through these polarizers is I have to make my photons many, many, many times and make these measurements many, 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 many times so that I can get out the probabilities. This is like if I hand you a coin and I ask you what's the probability that this coin is heads when you flip it. You can't just flip it once and tell me what the probability is. You have to flip it many, many, many times. You say, ah, OK, I flipped it a thousand times and 520 of the times it came up head, it's, it's probably a fair coin. I can't do that on a few flips. So we're going to do the same thing. So that means we have to make four different measurements. We have to jointly measure where we have our polarizers set as A1B1, as A1B2, as A2B1, and as A2B2. Great. So now let's talk about what happens on the classical hidden variable side and what happens on the quantum side. So on the classical side, even though the way we make this measurement is by we pick one pair of settings, we send a bunch of photons through, we pick another, we send a bunch of photons through, we can still think about what would have happened for each pair of photons had we had different measurement settings. That is to say, even though I can't actually measure for a given pair of photons a quantity like the sum of all of these things, but where I flip the sign of the last one. I can't actually make this measurement for a given pair of photons, but I can consider it. I can think, what would the outcome have been if I had been able to make this measurement? And so that means I can at least conceptually, theoretically, consider the average value of this. And these brackets here on the outside, those denote the average value of this. So this is a complete thought experiment. 
I make my two photons many, many, many times. And for each pair of photons, I think, all right, what is this quantity? Now, the quantum side, quantum mechanics says, no, 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 you're definitely not allowed to do that. The only thing that you have quantum mechanically is the measurement that you have made, which means for quantum mechanics, the thing that you have is, in fact, the sum of the averages in this way. This is the only thing that you're allowed to think about quantum mechanically is where you've made this measurement, then this one, then this one, then this one, and you take the sum, but where you subtract off the last one. So let's see what's different here. So on the classical side, I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to do the tiniest little bit of algebra. So all I've done here is regathered my terms so that I have a1 times the sum of b1 and b2 plus a2 times the difference of b1 and b2. Now, for any given pair of photons, b1 and b2i are either the same or they're different. Those are the only two possible outcomes. If they're the same, their difference is 0. And if they're different, because I've assigned plus and minus 1 to the two outcomes, their sum is 0. Which means for every single pair of photons that I create and then consider this quantity for, this whole thing inside my brackets here is either plus 2 or minus 2. Those are the only two outcomes. If I take the average over many, 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 many shots of numbers that are all, each one, either plus 2 or minus 2, my average can be at most 2 and at least minus 2. So this whole thing has to be between 2 and minus 2. Now on the quantum mechanical side, it turns out if I only had one photon or if these two were just photons that were independent and didn't know about each other, there's no way that I can violate these bounds. But it turns out there's something called an entangled state in quantum mechanics. And we can put down, write down particular entangled states of photons where quantum mechanics predicts a different outcome. We're going to go through that now. So the particular entangled state that we are going to consider is this, this state here, which I'm going to draw in typical quantum mechanical uh, notation, which you don't fully have to understand. But what it is is it's that a superposition of both photons having horizontal polarization and both photons having vertical polarization. That is to say, the photons have the same polarization, right? But each one has random. So if I only measure one, I'm just going to see random. But if I have both, then I'm going to see the same. And what that means is that quantum mechanics predicts for each one of these little quantities here, Quantum mechanics predicts that that's going to be like the cosine of twice the difference between those two angles. So if the angles are the same, then their difference is 0. And the cosine of 0 is 1. And that makes sense, because if the angles are the same, then I'm going to get the same value on both sides. And so I should get 1 out for this measurement. If the angle between them is 90 degrees, because I know the polarizations have to be the same, then I'm always going to get different outcomes on either side. And the cosine of twice 90 degrees is the cosine of 180 degrees, which is minus 1, which is what you expect if the outcomes are always different. So it turns out this is the quantum mechanical prediction, and it makes sense. Now, if I set my angles cleverly to be where A1 is at 45 degrees, A2 is at 0, B1 is at 22 and a half degrees, and B2 is at 67 and a half degrees, then I can write down each of these four terms, the cosine of the difference between A1 and B1 is the cosine of 45 degrees, is 1 over the square root of 2. The cosine of twice the difference between A1 and B2 is the same, cosine of 45 degrees. 1 over root 2 again. A2 and B1, again, twice the difference, 45 degrees, 1 over root 2. A2 and B2, their difference, though, is 67 and a half, which means twice that is 135. Cosine of 135 is negative 1 over root 2, but I already have a minus sign out front, which means when I add up all that, 
I get 2 times the square root of 2, which is larger than 2, right? That's super weird. The only assumption that we made over here was that we could do a thought experiment, not even a real experiment, a thought experiment where we considered this quantity, the quantity that we would get if we made all four measurements on the same pair of photons. But we saw over here that if we have specific pairs of photons that we make specific simultaneous measurements on, that the quantum mechanical prediction violates the bounds that we got over here. So Einstein came up with this whole concept of hidden variables that, in fact, just because we can't measure these things doesn't mean they don't exist. He came up with that in the 1930s. It was a few decades before John Bell realized the mathematical inequivalence between these two and wrote down what are called the Bell inequalities. They still weren't really experimentally testable at that point. Another decade went by, and John Clauser and colleagues came up with this formulation of how to test the difference between classical physics and quantum mechanics. And John Clauser won the Nobel Prize in 2022 for that development. And shortly thereafter, Elena Aspe and colleagues actually implemented this experiment and did a test and showed that, in fact, quantum mechanics is the law of the universe and quantum entanglement is real. And Elena Aspe also won the Nobel Prize in 2022 for the same thing. So thank you very much. That's been the weirdness of quantum mechanics. I hope you learned something. And take a look at the links posted below if you want to learn more or comment if you want to ask some questions. <laughs>